you turn in your Bibles to Joshua chapter 1, Joshua chapter 1, the Bible tells us here that Moses had passed away and that his servant Joshua would now continue his work and would lead the people of Israel into the promised land of Canaan after they had wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. And in verse 6, the Bible says, Be strong and of a good courage, for unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee, turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success." Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage, be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. In this journey, in this admonition, in this command, in this historic mission that Joshua was given, it required strength, strength of mind, strength of body, but it also required courage. It required his desire to fulfill his mission and his desire to follow through with what God had commanded him to do. Joshua and the people of Israel would have several foes in their way. They would have several obstacles to overcome. They would cross the Jordan River. They would face battles with Ai and Jericho and many kings of heathen nations. And even among themselves, they would face obstacles of individuals who would uh, seek to keep things that weren't theirs and would bring reproach upon the people of Israel. And so through all of this, Joshua, the leader, would indeed need to be strong and courageous because uh, he would need to pass on that strength and courage to those who are following him. And in our lives today, we face any number of obstacles and things that can get in our way, things that can cause us to be afraid, things that can cause us to stumble, things that can uh, cause us to uh, have doubt, as we talked about in our Bible class this, this morning. But we look to God's word and remind ourselves that with God, all things are possible. And that God encourages us as he encouraged his servant Moses and his servant Joshua to be strong and of a great courage, to be very courageous. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 13, uh, Paul writes to the church at Corinth who themselves had many obstacles and things that they had to overcome. And he tells them in verse 13, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, be strong. And so very uh, bluntly, if you will, Paul, as he begins to conclude this letter to the church at Corinth, having exposed some things that they needed to deal with, having dealt with some spiritual issues that were causing problems in that congregation, and individuals with whom he had to uh, deal with, he reminds them that they needed to watch, they needed to be uh, vigilant, as Peter tells us, to be vigilant, to be sober, to be uh, clear-minded, knowing that the devil, who is our adversary, walks around seeking to devour us. Paul here told the church at Corinth to be watchful, to be vigilant, to keep our eyes and ears open, to be mindful of the things that God had told us, and to be mindful of what those who hate God and those who despise God 
and those who would not have our best interest at heart would cause us to stumble. And he says, then stand fast in the faith. Jude 3, the, the faith that was once delivered to all the saints, the faith for which we contend today. We are to stand fast in that faith. Paul had just told the church at, Cor at Corinth that they could stand fast in that faith. He told the church at Galatia that that faith which they stood in was the place where they found liberty. Stand fast in the liberty wherewith you have been called. And so the liberty, the freedom that we have comes from standing in that great faith and remaining faithful to it. And then he says, quit you like men. Uh, be courageous, in other words. Don't turn back. Don't quit. Don't be a quitter. Be uh, ready to face the challenges. Be ready to oppose those who oppose God. And of course he ends with being strong. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, Paul told Timothy that God had not given us the power of fear, but the spirit of power. Not the spirit of fear, but the spirit of power. And so if we are following God's will, if we know what God has uh, told us to do, and if we are following those things that God has told us to do, if we have the courage to do what God says to do, if we're strong in the faith, then we can uh, be prepared to do whatever is needed in order to overcome all of those obstacles, knowing that God has given us not the spirit of fear but the spirit of power and that power comes from God's word and comes from knowing that God is faithful and just and he requires the same of us we read of many examples in the Bible of individuals who were strong who were courageous who stood fast in the faith who quit like men who did not quit who used that spirit of power that God had given us through His Word. And for a moment, we'll look at some of those examples as we can apply that to our lives today. Obviously, Joshua is one of those great examples. He and his uh, fellow faithful man, Caleb, who stood uh, in the face of uh, the majority who sought to give in to the power of fear or the spirit of fear rather than the spirit of power which was from God. In Numbers chapter 13, Numbers chapter 13, verse 30, the Bible says, Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and possess the land. This obviously 40 years before Joshua is told here uh, to be strong and of a great courage. Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. Joshua and Caleb saw the obstacles, but they didn't see the obstacles as things that would stop them from achieving what God had told them they could achieve. They simply saw it as something that they needed to overcome. But the men that went up with them said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. Here these individuals had given in to the power of fear and had not even started to fight. They had given up before the fight began. They lost not because they didn't have the ability. They lost not because they didn't have God on their side. They lost because they had not trusted in God. They lost because they had not given uh, to themselves to be strong and courageous as Joshua and Caleb had done. For that reason we know in Numbers chapter 14, that all individuals under uh, age of 20 would die in the wilderness except for Joshua and Caleb. Those two men 
because they understood God's will and were willing to trust God, uh, were able to go in Joshua chapter 1 through the end of that book to take over the, the land that God had promised to give them. We also note uh, another attempt at slaying a giant in 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17. In verse 32, the Bible says, David came to Saul. Saul was a mighty man of war, a king. David was a, a boy of small stature, a farmer. And he said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him, the giant. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Saul and the other men uh, of battle, men of war, when they looked at the obstacle, when they saw the giant, they saw something that was un, uh, overcomable. Whereas David saw an obstacle in the way that could be overcome. It was, the same, it was the same thing that they were looking at, but it was a different attitude with which they saw that which needed to be overcome. Some saw it as something that would stop them, and some saw it as something they needed to overtake. Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. And that may have been the case, had it not been for God, and had it not been for the right, strong attitude and courageous attitude of David. And David said to Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. Just as God had prepared Joshua to take on this great task, by allowing him to watch and to serve under Moses. God had prepared David for this great task, and David understood that his past had led him to this point. And rather than seeing the obstacle that was, that was a mountain that could not be climbed, David looked to his past and remembered how he had overcome the bear and overcome the lion, and that this was just one more obstacle to overcome. And so God had prepared him for those things, and he took that to heart, just as Joshua did, just as Caleb did. And so David said in verse 37, The Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. So David, we read in verse 38 and following, was girded with the sword and the the male of Saul, which was obviously too big for him. And so, in verse 45, well, verse 44, The Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls uh, of the uh, air and to the beasts of the field. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcass of the host of the Philistines this day to the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel." And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. And it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slung it and smote the Philistine in his forehead, that the stone sunk into his forehead, and he fell upon his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him, but there was no sword in the hand of David. Joshua and Caleb, uh, 
They saw the, the giants, but they saw only a hill that needed to be climbed. The rest saw mountains that were unclimbable, just as Saul and his mighty army with Goliath. But David knew that God was with him and that with God, this hill was something that could have been climbed. In Daniel chapter 6, Daniel chapter 6, In Daniel chapter 6, we read of a, a conspiracy that evil men had devised against the, the faithful man da- Daniel. And they saw no way to bring Daniel down except that they might use his pattern of faithfulness towards God against him. And they came to the king, verse 7, And they told the king that it would be good and in his good interest to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for thirty days except for the king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing that it be not changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians which altereth not. Wherefore, king Darius signed the writing and the decree. So these men appealed to the arrogance and the the pride of the king, uh, putting himself up above God. So here is a individual who has the power here on earth as a sovereign to put sub- subjects of his to death for disobeying law. You might call this an insurmountable mountain if you were to look at it in that way. But Daniel didn't see it that way. Daniel knew what the law was, but he knew what God's commands were. And before going into captivity, David had, or Daniel had been faithful to the system of law that he was under, the Jewish system. And because of that, he had remained faithful in certain customs to the best of his ability Having been in captivity, obviously being a captive, being a slave, he wasn't free to do all the commands of God under the Jewish system, but he did those things which he had opportunity to do. And so in verse 10, when Daniel knew that the writing had been signed, he went into his house and his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. Daniel knew that disobeying the law of the land came with the punishment of death. But God was with Daniel and Daniel respected the law of God rather than he, more than he respected the law of man. And Daniel saw that when the law of man contradicted the law of God, that it was right for him to disobey the law of man. And when you look at Daniel's life and the examples that he had gone through previously, he knew that doing what God said was always the right thing to do, no matter what. And even if it were to be the case that that was his life, he knew that it was better for him in the long run to give his life uh, in this physical fleshly life than to separate himself from God in the spiritual sense. Obviously, we know the story. The men caught Daniel doing as he had always done. They told the king Daniel was put in the lion's den, but God stayed off the lions, and Daniel lived. And because Daniel lived, he was able to help the king and bring about some help to others in in the kingdom. And to bring glory to God. Through one man's strength. Through one man's courage. uh, 
in overcoming a law that was in contradiction to God's law, his faithful prayers brought others closer to God. Where some would have seen the law as insurmountable and untacklable, David saw it simply as a hill he had to climb. That reminds us of Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. Another instance in which the people of God and obedience to God were seen in combatant with the law of the land or with the laws of man. In Acts chapter 4 verse 19 The Bible says, Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in thy sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had, heard, uh, when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing, how they might punish them because of the people. For all men glorified God for what was done. So after... Uh, Healing a man, they brought glory to God, knowing that doing so, preaching in the name of Jesus, could cost them their lives. In Acts chapter 5, verse 29, or verse 28, this council, these priests, these individuals with ability to put these men to death said, Did not we straightly command you that you should not teach in the name of Christ, and behold, your doctrine uh, and behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. And so Daniel, in his faithfulness to God's laws and his desire not to change his pattern, because his pattern was a way in which he could do what God had commanded to the best of his ability, and Paul and John and the other apostles choosing to put their own lives in danger to obey God, knowing that obeying God was better than obeying man in the long run for their souls, but also that it could bring strength and courage to those who saw them and heard them. And there are many more biblical examples of individuals who faced hills or mountains or tasks that seemed unclimbable or Individuals who could have looked at obstacles and saw walls. Rather, these individuals, Joshua and Caleb, David, Daniel, Paul and John, saw things that needed to be done, things that needed to be acted upon, not things that would keep them from doing what they needed to do. So we might ask ourselves as we apply these things to our lives, how are we to be strong and courageous today? How are we to apply these lessons to our lives? Is God calling upon us to be strong and of a good courage? Is He calling upon us to watch and be steadfast and be vigilant? Is He calling upon us to stand fast in the faith and to quit like men? Has He chosen us, has He chose those individuals to be strong in the, in the spirit of power as opposed to overcome by the spirit of fear. And we might say that all the commands of God and the examples of God lead us to say that yes, we are God's called and chosen people to be strong and courageous uh, no matter what the obstacle may be in front of us. When we look back to our original text in Joshua chapter 1, we note some very important things that made Joshua strong and courageous. And some of these things we've alluded to in these other examples. Notice in Joshua chapter 1, when God called him to be strong and of a good courage, and that he had a role for him to do, he had a mission for him to do, he had a command for him to do, he tells him, be strong and of a very courageous, verse 7, that thou mayest, number one, observe to do according to all the law, which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, 
that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. So the first and foremost thing in the mind of God as he passed on this mission to Joshua was, let the word of God be ever foremost in your mind, and when that is the case, you'll be strong and you'll be courageous because you'll know that God is with you. If you have God on your side, you will prosper, it says, whithersoever thou goest. Now, we know in this particular example, God knew that he had already given this land to Israel and that they were going to take it. They simply needed to act upon it. There are things that we may have to face today that we don't know if we're going to win or lose. But we do know this, that no matter what our obstacle is or whatever the hill we have to climb, if our first and foremost goal, if our first and foremost uh, place where we place our trust and we look to is the Word of God and we do not seek to go, from, uh, go to the left hand or to the right hand, we simply do what God says to do. We may not prosper in this physical life, but we will prosper hereafter. We will prosper hereafter. And if, our, if we are placing our treasures where it ought to be, not in this physical life, but in the one to come, then prospering in heaven is the greatest reward of all. And if I lose in this life, no matter what the hill I die on, or no matter what the consequence it is in this case, if I am doing God's will, and if I have not turned to the left or to the right hand, and I die on that hill, that obstacle that I face in this life, only to wake up in the morning and see God, then I think I would call myself victorious. We also note in Joshua, in verse 9, he says, Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. God is with us if we are doing his will. God is with us if we are simply doing what he commands us to do. And that's the first way we demonstrate courage today is by doing what God says to do, isn't it? You know, generally speaking, uh, that doesn't sound like something that takes a lot of courage, but it does. It takes a lot of courage to do what God says to do. There are uh, powerful influences that seek to keep us from doing God's will. Even in the first century, even in Joshua's day, 40 years before, we noted that there were 10 of the 12 tribes trying to convince Joshua and Caleb that they were wrong. And those ten individuals succeeded in, in, in keeping an entire nation of people from an inheriting a land God had already given them. And so by following the majority evil report, these individuals had to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. And Joshua and Caleb had to pay the price for that as well, except 40 years later they did get to enter into Canaan. But it takes strength and it takes courage to do what God says to do. Those ten tried to tell the two in that day that they were wrong, that they were foolish. And of course, the, the world, the Israelites, fell into that trap of believing the majority over the two men who had strength and courage. Today, we face all sorts of uh, influences who don't want us to do what God says to do. We face influences of friendships. We face influence from families. We face influence from people who do things differently, who believe things differently, who don't want to believe things the way they actually are. And when we do what God says to do, it is, as the Bible says, with regards to Abel. The actions of Abel condemned Cain. And the actions of Abel still today condemn wicked people because... Though Cain slew Abel, Abel took what God told him to do and was able to do it and was faithful in doing it. And if Abel was able to do it, then that proves that we can all do it. And so when today you do something right, when you simply do what God says to do, it condemns those outside. And those outside don't appreciate that. And those influences will try to force you to give in and to do things a different way or to at least compromise your convictions. And so seeking first the kingdom of God isn't 
quite as easy as it might sound, Matthew 6, verse 33. Jesus said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. That's His way of, uh, His plan by which we are seen as right in His eyes. Seek that first and all these other things will be added to you. Whereas the world and influences outside say, that is for people who are weak-minded. To, be, to think that they have to believe in a, in a higher power, a superior power. Believe in people who don't need a superior power like us. We're smart enough to do it on our own, right? And look what the smartness of the world has gotten us. Look where the intelligence of the world got Israel. Forty years wandering in the wilderness because they listened to the smart people. If they had listened to the people who knew what God wanted them to do, they would have never had to wander in the wilderness. They would have never died in the wilderness. They would have been able to see that promised land. And today we teach and preach that there's a promised land, a heaven, a Canaan, that awaits those who are faithful to Him. But the smart people say, don't believe that. Right? And of course, I'm using the word smart in a very uh, sarcastic way, accommodatively. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 22. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 10, verse 22. Jesus says, You shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. So we ought to seek first the kingdom of God, His church, and we ought to seek His plan to save. Not any man's plan to save, only God's. And then when we get to it, we need to recognize that the world will hate us and that we will be called to endure. Being faithful as we follow Christ shows courage today because individuals will try to seek, a, seek our harm and seek to get us off that path. Enduring persecution, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. God tells us that we must endure. Paul tells Timothy, he must endure hardships. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. 2 Timothy 3, verse 12. And in 1 Peter chapter 1, as we studied in our Bible class not too long ago, 1 Peter chapter 1. Verse 5 and verse 6. Peter says there is an inheritance that awaits those who are faithful. Verse 4. It's an inheritance that will not corrupt. It's an inheritance that will not be defiled. It's an inheritance that will not go away. It's a place reserved for those who are faithful. And verse 5 says, Are kept by the power of God through faith, unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. And of course, verse 7 speaks of the trial of our faith. Being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. We demonstrate courage today in the same way that Joshua ex uh, ex exemplified courage, the same way that David slaying Goliath showed courage, the same way that Daniel and his faithfulness to remaining, to doing what he knew was right and praying to God often was, uh, was exemplified. And we show the same courage when, as does Paul and John when they said, we will obey God rather than men. When we seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and we faithfully follow Christ, enduring any persecution and temptation and suffer, in, uh, suffer any trial that may come our way because of being faithful to God, we demonstrate our courage today. When do Christians need courage? <laughs> we need courage every day, don't we? We need courage every day. We face temptations every day. When do we need courage to overcome temptation? We face doctrinal error every day. When do we need courage to face doctrinal error? 
We face hardships. We face pain. When do we need courage? Every day. Some think courage is simply arguing a particular point of view. Arguing a particular point of view is part of defending the gospel, Jude 3. But courage for the truth is not just talking about it. Courage for the truth is acting upon it. And we act upon it when we hear God's word and we do it. Because when we do it, it proves that we believe it. Courage to do what is right is a sign that we love God and that we are faithful to God. When we give in to our fears, we allow the, our lack of trust to show through. And we ought to be loyal and courageous for the cause of Christ, just as these examples show for us today. The Bible tells us that faith, which leads us to strength and courage, comes by hearing the Word of God. So when we feel a lack of courage, a lack of strength, the best thing we can do is open up our Bibles and read it. Faith comes by hearing, Romans 10, verse 17. The, the more we read, the stronger our faith should become if we believe it. And when we believe it, it will lead us to act. The actions we talked about today were strength and courage. We need strength and courage to repent of our sins. When we note that something that we're doing is not in harmony with God's will, that takes courage. We need to repent of those things if they separate us from God. We need to... Uh, then be immersed in water if an individual has not done so in order to have his past, wash, past sins washed away. Any individual who wants to be right with God and seeks his plan to, of righteousness will note that baptism washes away sin, Acts 22, verse 16. It's the act which puts a person into Christ, Romans 6, 3-4. And so if any individual has not yet become a Christian and obeyed the gospel, the invitation is extended. If you've already obeyed those initial steps but have some other need, we're here to assist you as we can as we stand and sing.